Hello everyone and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 231. This week, as we are still in catch-up mode, the questions are taken from guides 274 and 275, that's the guides to the Yugoslavian destroyer Dubrovnik and the 1876 variant of HMS Temera, plus the accompanying Wednesday videos on the unryu ikoma classes of Japanese fleet carriers and the introduction to the Type 9 U-boat. So, let's begin. Brendan Boersdorf asks, I noticed some early submarines used either petrol or kerosene powered engines. What were the benefits of using these types versus a diesel engine, if any? The very earliest submarines did use gasoline engines as their above water drives. However, this was more a case of making do with what you had than any particular preference for it. The diesel engine, you've got to remember, was a very, very new technology. The very first commercial diesel engines basically weren't even produced until the very end of the 1890s. So given that submarines were entering service at effectively the same time, no one was going to be mad enough to stick a absolutely brand new drive technology into a submarine, even if the engines of the, that point were small enough and capable enough of producing enough power, because bear in mind early submarines were pretty small. Now, the take-up of diesel engines was relatively quick in certain navies. The French got their first diesel-powered submarines into the water relatively quickly, kind of 1903-1904, but other nations took a bit longer. So the Royal Navy was still running petrol engines on the C-Class, and it was only with the D-Class towards the very end of the 1900s, beginning of the 1910s, that you saw diesel in the Royal Navy. And even the German U-boat arm, surprisingly to some, was also a fairly late adopter of diesel engines. Petrol engines had significant hazards, not the least of which were the fumes, which could build up generally within the submarine, and also especially when the sub was running. And of course, gasoline, whilst it's not as flammable as the movies would have you think, is considerably more flammable, especially in vapour form, than diesel is. So there are a lot of risks associated with running a gasoline engine as opposed to a diesel engine. However, as I said, uh, f the first, there's questions as to will diesel engines actually work? Then there's questions as to are they small enough and powerful enough? Because generally speaking, a diesel engine at least at that point, is bigger and heavier for the same amount of power, which in a very, very small submarine has certain implications on what you can do with it. And there's also fuel availability to consider. It's kind of a microcosm of some of the concerns about adopting oil versus coal, and some of the concerns about adopting diesel for large ships in the 1930s and 1940s, as opposed to, at that point, oil. Diesel, again, being a relatively new technology, a diesel fuel distribution network wasn't really set up, whereas gasoline, for all of the various hazards we just described, did at least have some degree of a distribution network going on, even if it hadn't been necessarily for fuel, in terms of large engine fuel, for very long. But there was still a refining process uh, and a certain amount of industry associated with it. But no Navy was particularly happy with running gasoline-powered submarines on the surface because, as I said, of the explosive hazards and the the flammability, etc., etc. So as soon as each Navy thought that diesel technology in their country had advanced to the point where it was reliable enough, they switched over to diesel and they didn't look back. Niels Larsen asks... U-boats are often used in an offensive position, like hunting convoys or capital ships. But what about in a defensive position, such as if a country had a navy that only existed as a defensive measure, would it make sense to have U-boats? Submarines being used for defensive purposes are definitely a thing, and initially a lot of the early submarines were exclusively for this purpose, if for no other reason than the very early Holland-derived submarines didn't actually have all that much range so unless your enemy happened to be almost physically next door you couldn't go on the offensive with them anyway unless you did something odd like create a submarine mothership that would take them with you which they'd also try to do for torpedo boats but generally the first generations of submarines were almost exclusively used for harbor or coastal defense 
in the early days of submarines, apart from the range issues, this also made an awful lot of sense because there was precious little that surface ships could do to stop submarines from defending a coastline relatively effectively, both in terms of the fact that depth charges weren't invented until a good way into World War I, and of course there's no sonar, so as long as a submarine stays underwater and doesn't get spotted when it pops its periscope up occasionally, it actually doesn't matter whether you have destroyers, cruisers, etc. escorting a battleship, the submarine can still happily torpedo the battleship and there's precious little you can do about it. Obviously more ships out there means more eyes and also the submarine might actually attack something that's not a battleship if it can't get close enough because it's worried about getting run over by an escorting destroyer but that's a very marginal amount of safety compared to what you'd have later on. Now the reason I mention that is because as you get to later periods once you have depth charges and sonar and so forth then having submarines for purely defensive purposes does become a little bit more difficult because if your enemy knows that you have a submarine or submarines and they're planning on attacking you, then they are going to try and sanitize the environment that their big ships are operating in by having their escort ships going pinging away madly to make sure that your sub defensive submarines don't get into that space and of course the more and more constrained the operational area the submarine is in the more and more likely it is to be caught which then means that whilst having submarines for defensive purposes only remains a viable tactic in that era the submarines themselves have to get somewhat larger somewhat longer range and somewhat more capable as compared to an a-class or a b-class or something like that, simply because in order to have an operational area large enough that you're not you know, more than 50% likely to be detected and destroyed before you can accomplish anything, those defensive submarines would have to meet an a, opponent coming in considerably further out than just right off the coastline. At which point, you start to enter a little bit of a grey area of you may be using the submarines only in the purpose of defending your country, but in terms of their range and operational capability, they could also equally be used offensively. And if you are going to defend your country and you have a submarine with that kind of range, then where do you draw the line between absolute defence, proactive defence and taking the offensive that can be a bit of a, a blurry point despite whatever your in original intentions might be but in all cases it still makes sense to have subs bi -Fi commander asks why did japan's jeune école style fleet have so much trouble with the obsolete chinese ironclads you mentioned previously the japanese guns couldn't penetrate the armor belt and the main gun turret armor but they could clear out the crews from the secondary batteries at that point, the Japanese torpedo boats, recommended by the Jeune Ecole, could have had easy runs against the old ships that obviously weren't designed to resist torpedoes. So what am I missing here? Well, for the Battle of Yalu River specifically, also known as the Battle of the Yellow Sea, the Japanese torpedo boats couldn't destroy the Chinese armoured vessels on the grounds that there weren't any Japanese torpedo boats present. Um, this was kind of a problem that the Japanese found, well one of many that they found with the Jeune Ecole style fleet, in that at the time of the 1894-1895 war with China, a lot of the Japanese torpedo boats were very small. You know, the biggest that they had was maybe 200 tons. They had a few in the 120 to 200 ton range, but an awful lot of them were actually less than 100 tons. Now, whilst some of those were rated as ocean-going, that essentially meant won't tip over or get swamped if we go more than a couple of miles off the coast. It didn't necessarily mean can handle oceanic voyages over to the shores of another country to fight. Which meant that when the Japanese fleet showed up, the smallest thing they had was a gunboat and... There were torpedo-armed ships around, but the torpedo-armed ships were cruisers, which, of course, the main armament of the Chinese battleships could, in theory, engage if they tried to get close enough to launch their torpedoes, because torpedoes at the time were pretty short-range. Now, with that said, 
the Japanese did get that some torpedo boats over to the conflict area eventually and in other confrontations. So the Dingyuan, I think that's how it's pronounced, was eventually torpedoed by a torpedo boat, but that was at a later battle. And you see this kind of problem even cropping up for the Chinese because, of course, they're operating in their home waters. But a number of times when they go out on patrol, they have torpedo boats, which are of approximately the same displacement as some of their Japanese counterparts. And even operating off of their own coast, they do occasionally have to curtail patrols or send the torpedo boats back in because the weather means that they're struggling in the seaway. So if they're struggling, you could imagine what it would be like for the Japanese who are trying to get these things over from Japan. And more broadly, this was a fundamental problem with the Jeune École as it existed at the time that it was advocated for, because torpedo boats theoretically might make for a decent defence at home, although it was becoming very rapidly apparent that at ho even at home had a big asterisk after it, which was, you know, assuming that the sea state is fine and there isn't any particularly bad weather or even any particularly mild weather, the kind of weather that battleships actually really don't care about, but a 50 to 100 ton torpedo really, really, really does. And as also became evident in subsequent actions during the Sino-Japanese War, torpedo boats of that size, even assuming that they could reach the action and start to make their torpedo runs, being so small could be disabled by very little fire and even in some cases near misses. Old Richard asks, how many of the pre-1894 pre-majestic era ironclad oddities survived long enough to be scrapped during Fisher's house cleaning of Victorian leftovers? The surprising answer to some would be most of them. Essentially, as of the year before Fisher became first sea lord, Every major ironclad that the Royal Navy had built was still around in some way, shape or form, with two broad exceptions. You had the wooden-hulled ironclads, which were a mixture of converted wooden warships and ships that had been purpose-built with wooden hulls to use up timber stocks. Most of those had gone in the 1880s because their hulls had just begun to fail, and you also had Resistance, Vanguard, Captain and Victoria who weren't present by dint of the fact that for various reasons they'd sunk. Um, outside of that, literally every single ironclad that the Royal Navy had built was still around, as I said, either as an active vessel, believe it or not, as a training ship or in reserve. Now, to be fair to the Royal Navy, in 1903, the year before Fisher became First Sea Lord, you did see some movement on getting rid of them. Um, one or two of the, if you like, battleship ironclads were sold for breaking up in, eight, in 1903, and a reasonable number of the coastal defence ironclads were also sold for breaking up in 1903, the entire Cyclops class, for instance. But that was still a minority of the ships that were present. And then once Fisher comes in, uh, a whole raft of them are obviously either directly sold for breakup during his tenure, or they are put into non-active roles. So they quite a lot of them find roles as training ships, uh, accommodation vessels, or in the case of ships like Warrior, basically being turned not even into some kind of vessel, albeit stationary, but turned into something like an oil jetty. And that's how some of them will continue to last past Fisher's tenure into the 20s. But at that point, even they start being sold off because you then have ships of the pre-Dreadnought and early Dreadnought era that can be used for accommodation ships, etc., and are, of course, larger and in somewhat better repair at that point. Royo asks... Why the Royal Navy tradition of naming ships Temeraire, when it's entirely a French word? Was the original Temeraire just so good that it became a core part of Royal Navy tradition? Basically, it's the Battle of Trafalgar and this painting. <laughs> there was a, a Temeraire, in terms of ships of the line, there was a Temeraire before the Trafalgar Temeraire, which was the original French um, third-rate Temeraire, captured and then brought into Royal Navy services HMS Temeraire. They're going to be saying that word quite a lot in this answer, I think. Now, that Temeraire served for 
about two decades. It did okay, nothing particularly notable. And then in the early 1780s, it was broken up. Then at the beginning of the 1790s, the Royal Navy decided it was going to order some second rates. And one of the names they picked was Temeraire. But I think basically because at that point, the Royal Navy was maintaining a minor tradition in the Napoleonic Wars of keeping ships in service that had the names of French ships that they'd captured that they thought they could use. Uh, they did change a few names here and there where it was either, as far as the Royal Navy was concerned, hideously unpronounceable or not particularly suitable, but Tamaraire was fine. And as a result, they ended up with a second-rate Tamaraire, which was a 98-gun ship that they could then effectively wave at the French, go, ha-ha, remember your other Tamaraire? Well, look, we've, we've still got a ship with its name, so na 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 which sounds childish, but it's pretty much a good summary of why the Royal Navy was doing this kind of thing. Uh, and then you have the Battle of Trafalgar, where, of course, Temeraire comes to the assistance of victory, which makes it an integral part of both the history and the mythology of Trafalgar, which in turn means that their name is elevated somewhat in Royal Navy parlance. And then you have Turner's painting, which you can see here, uh, when she's been, being taken to be broken up in the 1830s. And that kind of cements the name into the lexicon of the Royal Navy. And so every so often when somebody wants to revive the spirit of Trafalgar or just come up with a re relatively cool name for a ship, they keep referencing back to Temeraire because it's one of the top-end picks. So, of course, you would have had, if the Lion class first pair had been built you would have had lion and temeraire there plus all obviously all the ones that were built but to be perfectly honest if you look back at the order of battle for trafalgar the ships of the line that were present you'll notice that pretty much all, all of them then become repeatedly used in the royal navy if those names hadn't already been repeatedly used before with one or two exceptions here and there. There's not too many HMS Tonnants after Trafalgar. But the names of Trafalgar, or some variation thereof, like Spartiate or Spartan Prince or Prince of Wales, Achille or Achilles, etc., they're all pretty much embedded in Royal Navy naming conventions now. Douglas Platt asks, How are depth charge throwers such as K-guns and Y-guns reloaded at sea? Also, how are additional depth charges added to the roller racks during a fight? Is it just the muscle power of the crew? Where possible, no. So here is a picture of one of, I think this is a K-gun being reloaded. And as you can see, they do actually have a small crane system, which, well, a rope and pulley system, I should say because uh, there's no motorization involved. So technically, yes, it's the muscle power of the crew, but assisted. And as you can see, they are reloading one of the things. Now, this is the ideal situation. And if you see something like the installations on USS Slater or on HMCS Sackville, uh, two of the ships that have survived with these installations in place, you'll see that where possible, these kinds of uh, assisting devices are present to help you reload because a depth charge is not exactly a lightweight object. But nonetheless, there are times and locations where such a assisting device is not going to be present or it's not going to be practical to use it. And at that point, you would have to contend with the fact that a depth charge, at least with the type seen here, weighs around about 200 kilos. So they are pretty hefty things but they are not outside of the realm of possibility for people to manhandle. Now, you, it's not going to be a two-man job. You probably want a, it to be a four-man job, maybe a three-man job if they're particularly strong. And, of course, you have to factor in the, the ship's going to be pitching and rolling, so it's not going to be just a simple deadlift. But it would be physically possible to reload a K or a Y gun using muscle power alone if you absolutely have to. So, for example, the working party here, if the uh, mechanism failed, would, in theory, be able to reload the weapon. When it comes to the depth charge rails at the back, you normally try and have as many depth charges on them as possible. So if you were on the verge of running out, that would be more of a concern than the fact you had to reload them, I think. Uh, 
uh, if you're in the middle of an action. But if you had to, they do have one significant advantage over reloading a K-gun or a Y-gun, which is that the crew would tend to stash a lot of the depth charges that were spare around on the deck of the ship. You can see in the background there some of the wooden brackets that were used to support depth charges. And in that case, it's a matter of rolling the depth charges over to the rails and getting them set up on it, which is a lot, lot easier than lifting a depth charge five or six foot off of the deck. John Jack asks, how did the U-boats deal with saltwater corrosion of deck guns? There are a variety of ways, and a lot of these are common across pretty much any submarine force of World War I or World War II. First step, if possible, is to make your guns out of somewhat more corrosion-resistant materials than perhaps would be necessary for guns on land. The second step, because obviously there's only a limited amount that you can do with that because the guns still have to withstand the same kinds of forces in terms of uh, breach pressure and the shock of firing, etc. Um, but then one, once you've done that, if possible, then you can also coat the guns wholly or in part with some kind of corrosion resistant material, such as uh, chroming them. Then you obviously also paint them and probably with several layers and keep that paint going. You obviously put a tampion or stopper in the barrel to prevent water from getting into the barrel itself, which would be very bad because there's not a lot you can do to stop the interior of the barrel rusting. The barrel liner is going to have to be made out of very specific steels and they don't tend to react very well to water. And therefore the interior of the barrel would also be oiled or greased. And... If necessary, then you would also apply oil and or grease to the gun itself. Now, that wouldn't usually, if you had a relatively corrosion-resistant gun that had been very well painted, that wouldn't usually involve slapping the entire gun with grease, but moving parts where the, the various elements might rub up against each other and rub off the paint, or where there might be, you know, screw threads or something like that, which you obviously couldn't paint because it's already put together. All of those areas would have a heavy and generous coating of grease. And then, of course, there would be regular maintenance when you could. Obviously, you're not going to just pop up every day to maintain the guns because that would be somewhat hazardous. But you would regularly maintain the guns if you were, say, in a relatively quiet patch of the ocean or obviously when you get back into harbour. And apart from the constant submersion and pressure issues, a lot of those same issues affect the guns of ships, which is why you'll see guns that had previously been ship-mounted, like, say, the 5-inch guns that US submarines were eventually equipped with, or, as you can see here, the 37mm guns that German U-boats were equipped with, they might very well just be taken off of existing ships or be taken off the production line for existing ships because they also had to a certain degree been weatherproofed because they have to withstand the saltwater environment as well and you can see how successful those measures were by the fact that well here's a pair of 37 millimeter guns from u534 which have had very minimal cleanup and spent more than half a century on the bottom but as you can see whilst they have rusted a bit, they are still very, very recognisable as 37mm guns, and if they were cleaned up a little bit, they probably could be made fully operational if you could get a licence for that, whereas a lot of other steel objects that have been on the bottom of the ocean for 50 years will be mostly rust by volume at this point. The Juggatron asks, what was the interplay between design and engineering in the development of the Battleship, Dreadnought, Super Dreadnought, and Fast Battleship. Could any of these have been built years before their historical deployments, except that Naval Design Bureau seemed to like conventional or evolutionary designs? So could we have seen a design like Dreadnought in the 1890s, or a classic pre-Dreadnought in the 1870s, just without quick-firing guns? If we ignore the range issue, which is another factor in the development of the Dreadnought, because long range longer barrel weapons meant that you could actually now engage along with obviously rangefinders far beyond the distance of the secondary batteries uh, 
But you know, if we hand wave that aside and just look at was it physically possible to build something that looked like a dreadnought, albeit with shorter barrel guns, before dreadnought came about, or was it possible to build a pre-dreadnought in the ironclad era, the two big restrictions are propulsion and armour. With propulsion, that's because effectively power density to get a ship moving at a reasonable amount of speed you need a certain amount of power and the earlier boilers and engines just weren't as capable as later boilers and engines would be whether that be single expansion going to double expansion going to triple expansion going to turbines going to geared turbines and so on and you know, boilers going from fire tube to water tube to small water tube etc etc and this is one of the reasons why when you see some of the early dreadnoughts like the Nassau's, because they use the older forms of propulsion technology, they don't have as much space amidship, so they have to go for a hexagonal layout of their guns. So getting a fast battleship earlier is going to be very difficult because, well, you can look at Hood. You know, she has, as I've mentioned before, about the same level of protection as a Queen Elizabeth class battleship and the same armament, but to get the speed that's necessary to be a fast battleship, she is so much larger. Now, granted, if you dialed that down to the kind of standard definition of fast battleship of the late 1930s of 28 knots, you might be able to get the ship a little bit quicker. I mean, as has been mentioned, Jellicoe was fairly convinced that a small tube boiler Queen Elizabeth could probably hit 28 knots. But you, I think the earliest you could get a fast battleship under that kind of definition would probably therefore be the early 1910s. When it comes to the dreadnought all big gun layout, as I said, there are tactical reasons, but ignoring those in terms of could just could you fit that many heavy guns on a ship significantly earlier than dreadnought, well, between the size of the ship and the propulsion issues I mentioned... I don't think you're going to see it much earlier. Obviously, you have Cuniberti's ideal battleship, which is an all-big gun design, but has all of the new all-big guns that it introduces in wing turrets. So from a very notional perspective, you might be able to pull off a Dreadnought type a few years ahead of time, but certainly not before 1900. And then when it comes to the pre-Dreadnought type possibly being built earlier this is where you run into the armour issue. So this is the previous HMS Dreadnought in dock. And as you can see in common with a lot of ironclads of the time, she has a very, very low freeboard. You've got all this underwater hull and then that little black band, that's the only above water portion of the hull. And other than that, she does look somewhat pre-Dreadnoughtish. She has a twin turret up front and a twin turret aft. They actually both have 12 inch guns. And in theory, you could put some secondary 6-inch, or as you mentioned, not quick firing, down the sides. But with the use of iron and then compound armour, because it is obviously weaker than nickel steel, which is weaker than Harvey steel, which is weaker than Krupp steel, in terms of resisting penetration, you need much, much thicker armour. And that's the reason for this low freeboard, because if you want an armour belt that's thick enough to stop the incoming projectiles then iron or compound armor has to be a lot thicker, therefore a lot heavier. Therefore, if you have the ship with a higher freeboard, either that freeboard isn't going to be protected or you're going to end up with too thin an arm belt or too top heavy a ship. And so whilst you can build something that looks like a slightly flooded, very squat pre-dreadnought in the 1870s, which as you can see, pretty much this is what Dreadnought, Devastation and Thunderer actually are, you can't get the classic pre-Dreadnought, i.e. high freeboard, high speed, etc, etc, because you won't be able to protect it well enough. Spintanium asks, how were local transfers between islands handled by the US in World War II? My grandfather served as a pharmacist's mate during the Solomon and Admiralty Islands campaigns. At various points, he was transferred via aircraft, PT boat, and once in a submarine. Did moving personnel and equipment locally change as the war progressed, or was it more a case of just get them over there with whatever craft is available? There is a bit of variation depending on who is being moved, but just get them there with whatever craft is available would pretty much be the general description. 
Now, as a pharmacist, mate, therefore as part of the relatively small but vital medical contingent aboard a ship, your grandfather would have had slightly higher priority than most, because obviously if a ship is short a pharmacist, mate, that could be a fairly significant impact on its capability to deal with medical issues up to and including, in theory, um, battle casualties. So when he was needed at specific places, they would probably look and think, OK, what's the next vessel or aircraft that's heading in that direction? Let's get him on that. And yeah, as you mentioned, it could be a plane, a PT boat, a submarine, a ship, whatever. When it comes to more general crew transfers, those tend, not always, but tend to be in somewhat larger amounts, at which point, you know, sending them by a whole flotilla of PT boats is really a bit impractical and somewhat unnecessary because as long as the transfer happens within a certain window, no one's going to particularly be too fussed if it happens on a Monday or Wednesday or a Thursday. And so if you've got, I don't know, let's say two, three dozen crew that need to be exchanged, then they'll probably wait and see, OK, what's the next ship that's heading out there and send them that way. Whereas if you've got specific officers, again, if they've got a plane heading that way or something, um, you know, a lieutenant, a commander, maybe even a captain will quite often just get on the next available transport to get there as quickly as possible. When it comes to admirals, it becomes a little bit more interesting, though, because obviously an admiral is important. Uh, they tend also to have staff. Those staff may or may not be of a particular number. Admiral Lee's staff for a very long time was quite small. Other admirals had dozens of people on their staff for various reasons. So relocating all of them might be a bit difficult to do on a PT boat or a sub or most aircraft because there might be too many of them. But then again, if Admiral Lee shows up with two or three other guys, well, stick him on a flying boat. It can probably get there pretty easily. But the flip side is, of course, once you get to flag officer rank, you do have to be a little bit more careful with their safety because not to be harsh, but you know, if a commander is transferred because a Catalina happens to be heading in that direction and the Catalina runs into a random Japanese fighter and gets shot down, that's an individual tragedy, but the US can probably find another commander from somewhere. Whereas if someone like Admiral Lee or Admiral Halsey has, suffers the same fate, you're not going to scare one of those up anytime soon easily. At which point, transfers of admirals tend to be done in slightly bigger ships like heavy cruisers or battleships that are coming on and offline. But that's just general principles. You know, there were individual crew who got cycled out on very small craft and there were admirals who showed up on planes and equally speaking there were mid-ranking officers and crew who would only really ever be transferred when another battleship came alongside and etc etc hence the kind of get them there with whatever craft is available but within reason and with qualifiers as to rank importance and number of people being transferred. Rian Antin asks did you find out why they didn't just use the existing Shikaku class design and build additional ships of that class this is instead of the Unryus one would assume they could have restarted production much faster than redesigning and retooling for a completely new class. Essentially because the Shikakus were too large and too complex for what Japan needed. At the time that the Japanese started to build the Unryus, they realised they were going to need a reasonable number of aircraft carriers pretty quickly, considering that, well, in 1942 they'd lost most of their existing fleet. And not only did the size of the Shikakus mean that it would be quite difficult to complete them quickly, their size also meant that there were only so many places you could actually build them. Whereas if you make the Unryus, which are based off of Hiryu and Soryu, then because they are just that little bit smaller, you can fit them into more dockyards, which means you can build more of them simultaneously, as well as obviously by being smaller, you can build them faster. And if you look at the Shikaku and Zuikaku, 
okay, it's peacetime, so maybe there wasn't quite the level of urgency involved, but it did take just over three years on average to get a Shikaku class from keel laying to completion. Now, bearing in mind the Japanese are looking at laying down the Unryus in mid to late 1942, three and a half years, that's 43, 44, 45, you're looking at the end of 1945, maybe early 1946, and they can't afford that. Even if you cut uh, about six months off of that for wartime urgency, you're going to get a few large carriers in early 45, maybe, maybe late 1944, if you're really, really lucky. Whereas when you look at what they managed to do, even with the impositions on resources that were made, because obviously in World War II, Japan wasn't doing particularly brilliantly for a lot of resources, courtesy of the US submarine fleet, the Unryu and Amagi, for example, were still able to be completed in, roughly speaking, two years from keel laying to completion. Um, Katsuragi as well. And in Amagi's case, actually slightly quicker than two years which meant that they began to come online in mid to late 1944, which, granted, by that point, the Japanese weren't in a position to really make much use of them, but if the war hadn't gone quite as disastrously for the Japanese between mid-1942 and mid-1944 as it did, then they still would have had some utility, whereas no Japanese naval planner was looking to late 1945 and thinking that, well having no additional carriers apart from Taiho come online during that period would be a good thing. Plus, with the losses that the Japanese carrier arm had suffered during 1942 when they were planning the Unryus, they also had to consider the fact that it was relatively likely that they would lose a reasonable number of these carriers relatively quickly, at which point it would be better to have slightly more even if they were slightly individually less capable carriers, as opposed to putting all your eggs in a few shikaku-shaped baskets and potentially getting them all knocked out again in a major battle. Not that the Unryus had an insubstantial aircraft capacity, but obviously it is less than the shikakus. And of course, you don't just generate a plan out of nowhere. The Japanese were thinking about the potential to need carrier replacements even before the Pacific War was launched, and that's why they started off with Hiryu as a design, because as mentioned, it's lighter, it's smaller, it's much quicker to build, whereas Shikaku and Taiho, yes, they were more recent designs, but they take a lot longer to build and were therefore less suitable for mass production, because the Japanese didn't have the level of industry that the US had with the Essexes. Atomic Bretonic asks... It's been said that the Montanas were designed to counter what the Allies thought the Yamatos were going to be. They also underestimated what the Yamatos really were, so are there any sketch designs or blueprints to show what the Montanas would have looked like if the true specs of Yamato were known, and if not, what would be your best guess? Not really, because the Montanas as they came out had, at least design-wise, had pretty much one of the thickest armour belts of all the design considerations that had been made, and the heaviest armament of all the design considerations that had been made, because a number of Montana designs looked at having nine guns, and then there were the 12-gun variants, which is obviously what the historical Montana design is a descendant thereof. But the other Montana designs that were perhaps larger than Montana, as she eventually emerged don't really make any concession to being more heavily armed or more heavily protected. They merely make a concession towards being faster. So you have the what some people have dubbed the long tanner design because the Montana overall length was 921 foot and the long tanner was going to be 1,050 foot. But what that extra length bought you was more speed, i.e. it was how do we get something with 16 inches of armor belt and 12 16 inch guns up to 33 knots so it can compete with the Iowas and then when you look at the designs that were sketched up or mentioned in the aftermath of Montana's design being frozen i.e when the ships were suspended you know the US Navy was looking at well with war experience what can we do 
it was mostly about redistributing armor potentially from the belt to the deck to withstand air attack better. And then subsequent to that, once the Montanas had been cancelled and the, the, the last gasp US Navy battleship designs, again they reference more the Iowas because the US design emphasis for battleships by the mid to late part of World War II has shifted over towards definitely wanting the speed to keep up with the carrier groups and extreme emphasis on the anti-aircraft armament which tracks with the US Navy's experience in World War II. So there's no particular sketches that you can point to and say ah yes this particular variant would have been better at fighting a Yamato than the historical Montana design with the possible slight exception of Long Tanner which would have had a four to five knot speed advantage over Yamato which could have been handy in tactical situations but in terms of what the US Navy would have done had they known the true specs of Yamato to be perfectly honest I don't think they would have changed an awful lot maybe they would have gone for Long Tanner for that tactical speed advantage but let's be honest an inclined just over 16 inch belt is going to be fairly handy against Yamato's guns and it would take a fairly substantial increase in displacement and size to get it to much greater than that and in terms of firepower well the 16 inch 50 is almost not quite but almost as good as Yamato's 18.1 inch um, and of course Montana has 12 of them instead of nine on the Yamato's so Montana is a perfectly viable matchup for Yamato as she is there are tweaks here and there which you might be able to do to give her a slightly greater advantage against Yamato but there's nothing about Montana that is deficient compared to Yamato. Smokey the Bear asks, Japanese spotter dash observer planes used coloured flares to mark, it is thought, the location, course and speed of the cruiser group in attacks that sunk USS Chicago in World War II. Books like the Battle of Surigao Strait note that Nishimura's float planes were extremely well utilised. Do you know of any reference that covers the topic including what the different colours meant? Now, I think that the original citation, the way this has sort of gotten around, is from the book South Pacific Destroyer, the Battle for the Solomon Islands from Savo Island to Vela Gulf, where it mentions in the account about the attack on Chicago... Um, after the first attack, it, the paragraph says, Thinking the raid was over, Giffen continued on course as before and ceased zigzagging for the night. As the darkness deepened, white float lights could be seen on the water on both sides of the formation, while red and green float lights were sighted on the surface ahead, apparently marking the location and course of the American formation. Finally, a yellowish parachute flare appeared in the sky ahead and descended slowly. So, I think that's the impression that the US side got that you know, perhaps these two white lines of white float lights are denoting the corridor in which the US ships are moving, and then perhaps these red and green float lights are headed denoting something about speed. I personally am not aware of such a complex system in place for Japanese float planes to be marking targets. Now, I could be wrong, um, but if somebody knows a bit more about exactly the meaning and technique of Japanese float planes in relation to were, were they using these things to denote course and speed etc then please obviously let us know in the comments below however in the interrogations of Japanese officials after World War II it's recorded by obviously the Japanese Navy officials who are answering that prior to 1944 because they made a change in 1944 to make things easier but prior to 1944 flare attack policy at night when it came to attacking US uh, ships using torpedo bombers was for the torpedo bombers to all arrange themselves in formation and then for the float planes to drop flares three to five thousand meters behind the target ships which would then illuminate them and that would then allow the bombers to approach from the darkness with the targets backlit which they would then drop their torpedoes on. Now, that doesn't make any mention, the interrogation, about 
float lights and flares being used to indicate course and speed, etc. All I can surmise is that the float lights were perhaps being dropped by the float planes in order to give them some rough idea about where the US ships were, which would then mean that when it came time for the torpedo bombers to launch their attack, the float planes would relatively easily find where exactly they needed to drop the flare, which obviously is indicated at the end of that paragraph, this big yellowish parachute flare, in order to properly illuminate the targets for the attack. So my feeling would be that it's it's not so much an indication for the attacking torpedo bombers themselves and more of an aid memoir to the float planes so that when the torpedo bombers signal, OK, yep, yeah, we're ready to go in for the attack or the float plane commander decides it's time for the attack, whichever one is applicable, then the float plane's going to go, right, OK, that's roughly where they are now. We can maybe see the lights of these float lights reflecting off of the hulls or being obscured by the hulls as they move through the water and so we need to drop our flare here that would as a my that would be my sur surmisation my guess I, I suppose you could call it um but if anyone knows specific details about how the japanese used flares if they did use them in a more complex way for coordinating air attacks at this point then let us know because we'd all like to know <laughs> Chief Eyeroll asks, what were the main hunting grounds of American and French privateers during the American Revolution? For the Americans, did that change as the war went on? The two areas of operations were very different. So French privateers basically get, got on with the same activities they tended to get on with during any of the many wars with Britain during this time period. And they would privateer and raid wherever they reasonably could. Usually this was the mid-ocean, but along specific trade routes. They were also relatively active in the Indian Ocean. And they had to quite, kind of strike a balance because obviously there's no Suez Canal at this point. But there were certain areas like some of the South American ports or around the tip of South Africa. And obviously the Western approaches into the UK where you could guarantee that there would be significantly more shipping and therefore you know a greater chance of running into something worth having the flip side of that was of course that the royal navy knew exactly where those places were as well and so the greater the concentration of shipping the more likely you were to run into convoys and the more likely you were to run into royal navy ships which were patrolling looking for the privateers so french privateers tended to just V generally across the world occasionally darting into more heavily trafficked areas and otherwise looking for ships just traveling on the high seas generally depending on the strength of the british response at any given time the american privateers however were somewhat different uh, for a start a lot of american privateers in the early part of the american war of independence were fairly small ships so they couldn't actually go that far anyway and also they had the lucky fortune of, of course, because the American Rev Revolution or American War of Independence was being fought on what would later become U.S. soil. It meant that the British were sending a lot of very heavily loaded, very valuable supply ships to America. OK, trade, perhaps not so much was going on during that period but there were lots of ships loaded with valuable military supplies as well as more general, you know, food, etc., and because the Americans knew that these ships had to enter certain ports, whether that be Boston or New York, etc., then they could patrol off the coast, look for these ships, and try to grab them. And they were fairly successful in some of those captures, which had you know a double advantage for them, maybe even a triple advantage, because they didn't have to go very far. So that was good. So that meant privateers could outfit smaller, cheaper craft, which meant more people could get involved. Uh, secondly, it meant that they could get their prizes back into port relatively quickly, so they could be back out and looking for more prizes fairly soon. And thirdly, in the context of it being a war for independence, it meant that if they captured a bunch of muskets and powder and shot, like, say, with the supply ship Nancy, which they did manage to capture, well, then by bringing that in, not only did they make a tidy profit, but all of those weapons went into the hands of... George Washington's army or various 
uh, local garrisons, etc. So it strengthened the cause as well. As the conflict went on, the privateers became more numerous and some of their ships got larger, and so American privateers did, to a certain extent, start to range out somewhat further than the coastal areas of what would become the United States of America. But for the most part, the majority of U.S. privateer activity was concentrated in the what you would basically call the Western Atlantic. It's not really until the War of 1812 where, or perhaps if you want to look at it another way, maybe the Quasi-War with France, where American privateers start to range significantly further out in relatively large quantities in comparison to the total number of privateer missions. Partly because, obviously, their ships by this point are bigger and better equipped, and partly because during both the Quasi-War and the War of 1812, the territorial integrity of the continental United States, such as it is at that point, is largely maintained, with exceptions towards the end of the War of 1812. But as a result, it means if you want to find supply ships and merchant ships to plunder, you're going to have to go further afield. Sam Signorelli asks, It might be just past the end of the period the channel covers, but what are your thoughts on the Convair Sea Dart fighter prototype? I'm the surviving member of the restoration crew for the example outside the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Uh, we did the work when I was in high school, and it was fun to see the older retired folk give my father a hard time as he was a young engineer on the project. Of course, I also remember my dad giving me a bucket and sending me into the empty engine bay to bail out the water that had collected inside as she'd sat out in the open for almost three decades. I certainly tried to hit him when I chucked the rusty water out of the engine intakes. Well, the sea dart is kind of right on the edge of uh, channel applicability. Technically, yeah, it made its flights in 1950s, which is outside of the channel's period of coverage, but it was an entry into a 1948 contest, so you could say its origins lie just about within the channel's um, realm of applicability. Now, obviously, the ultimately, it, it, they, it wasn't necessary. The the big concern, the reason why it was built in the first place, was because people were worried that supersonic aircraft with long takeoff runs might not be able to take off from aircraft carriers, and so a hydro ski supersonic fighter was apparently the way to go. <laughs> Saunders Rowe, who had um, developed the a flying boat fighter, uh, seemed to have agreed with Convair because the next generation of design that they came up with although they didn't build a prototype in the end, was the P-121, which was also a hydro-ski fighter, because it meant that you didn't have to make too many concessions in terms of the hull of the aircraft to the fact it was going to be on water, which you, of course, did have to with a flying boat design. Now, as for my thoughts on it, well, it's an interesting solution to a problem that was had at the time. Of course, the problem for the design was that the problem it was designed to overcome was itself overcome in other ways relatively quickly and of course you then see the debut of supersonic aircraft aboard aircraft carriers so by the time the prototype and subsequent aircraft are being tested it's already got to a point where the comp even the relatively minimal compromises you need to make for a hydro ski fighter as opposed to a flying boat hull fighter are no longer necessary so in some in some ways albeit not quite as disastrously the hydro ski fighter is a bit like the k class in that they're designed to address a very very specific problem and theoretically they do so but by the time they are actually ready to go the issue they're supposed to solve has either gone away or has advanced to a point where they can no longer solve it. Plus, of course, the very big elephant in the room, which nobody seems to have thought about with either flying boat or hydro ski fighters, is that it all works fine and well and good when the seas are relatively calm, but such aircraft would rapidly become inoperable, either in terms of being unable to take off or being unable to land, in sea states that are significantly below what an aircraft carrier could actually operate in so you know it's all even if for arbitrary reasons it proved impossible to operate a supersonic aircraft off of an aircraft carrier uh, a hydro ski supersonic aircraft uh, 
would only be fine when the weather's nice and then once the weather becomes bad then super then the subsonic aircraft would rule because they're the only ones who can actually get off the ground or off the flight deck in this case although i must admit some small part of me does want to imagine a gigantic hydroski fighter tender with numerous cranes on either side lowering uh, schools of these things into the water and then when an air alert sounds you suddenly see hundreds of little contrails or, or they be booster trails along the sea as you know squadron after squadron of these hydroski fighters suddenly it, it rise up into the skies dr wa asks fleet admiral william Leahy was the first u.s officer appointed to five star rank yet he isn't mentioned often who was he and how did it happen that he was promoted first ahead of in order marshall king macarthur nimitz eisenhower and arnold so I have a feeling I have talked about him before, but briefly speaking, he was the senior most military officer in the United States during World War II, because you had King, who was obviously in charge of the Navy, you had Marshall, who was in charge of the Army, and you had Arnold, who you mentioned, who was in charge effectively of the Air Force, albeit it hadn't quite become the Air Force at that point. Um, it's still the Army Air Force, but nonetheless... Leahy was recalled by the president to be his effectively personal advisor dash strategy maker and therefore although he technically was not the supreme commander of all US military forces he did sit above King Arnold and Marshall and so the reason you don't hear about him too much is that whilst obviously the other three were specifically in charge of their branches of the military and then their subordinates like Patton and Halsey and Nimitz etc etc were all off you know actually conducting active campaigns Leahy was by and large mostly back in the United States itself in Washington um, relaying strategizing and talking with people which doesn't tend to get quite as much mention in the history books as you know people who are leading fleets into battle or coordinating grand strategy in the pacific in a more direct frontline role like nimitz but because of his role as being the senior most officer it meant that when the five-star rank was created he would be the first one eligible and that's not just in terms of the position he held at the time but if you want to look at annapolis graduation dates of the four Ad fleet admirals who would be created you actually have Leahy as the most senior he's also technically speaking the only um, fleet admiral to have graduated in the 19th century as he left Annapolis in 1897 um, then uh, Ernest King obviously graduated from Annapolis just after the turn of the century so he was next in line both in terms of seniority in the navy and in terms of his Annapolis graduation date and of course he was the immediate subordinate of Leahy interestingly Halsey actually graduated the year before Nimitz but Nimitz got the rank first because Nimitz was of course Halsey's superior officer by 1944-45 which was when the rank of Lee Admiral was being handed out and finally for this week we have TXK234 who asks do you think the tender Akitsushima was effective with only one flying boat as her entire air complement? Well, I think what you've got to remember when it comes to Akitsushima is the difference between a seaplane tender and or flying boat tender and a seaplane carrier. Now, yes, a seaplane carrier, you would expect to have considerably more aircraft aboard. However, a seaplane tender is, OK, occasionally carrying an integral air group but usually is separate from the aircraft that it's supposed to be maintaining and when it comes to a Kitsushima she was designed pretty much with the purpose of maintaining large flying boats which is why you see her air complement listed as one but that aircraft is a very big aircraft either an H6K or an H8K flying boat big four engine things and although she could sail around with one strapped to the back the point wasn't for Ikitsushima to go running around with an H8K or something on the back although obviously there are photos of her with one 
uh, mounted astern, but that's mounted astern for maintenance and repairs, not for tootling around the Pacific with. So although she can only service one flying boat at a time, she can in fact service multiple flying boats in a given location. So if she was used, say, parked in an atoll, you could have multiple H6Ks or H8Ks land at the same time or come in over the course of several days and she could work on each of them and send them on their way until, of course, her supplies run out. And you see the same thing with a number of US seaplane tenders at the time. Um, you know, if you've got a, a Martin Mariner flying boat showing up, you ain't getting more than one of those on the back of your average US seaplane tender. But there are also photos of, you know, two or three mariners clustering around a seaplane tender waiting their turn. And this is pretty much the same context that a Kitsushima is found in. So, broadly speaking, in concept, you know, she would be pretty effective. It's just that, as with so many things that the Japanese planned specialist ships for, what they thought was going to happen and what actually ended up happening turned out to be two rather different things. And obviously, Kitsushima was converted partway through the war to be a repair ship instead. The Japanese use of flying boats, although, again, they were fairly big and impressive aircraft, didn't quite pan out the way that the German use of flying boats or the British use of flying boats or the American use of flying boats really did with things like the Catalina and the Sunderland, in the Allies' case. Um, the H-8K, apart from being a rather nice-looking aircraft, is in some circles mainly known for the fact that they conducted the second attack on Pearl Harbor and nobody noticed. So that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, that means we only have a Patreon Dry Dock sitting between us and when I head back to the States. So just a reminder to check out community posts and on the website as linked in the video description below if you want to know more about that and potentially find out where I can be found during that trip.